good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to DICOM Industries' first quarter fiscal 2025 results conference call. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 1 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your host today, Mr. Stephen Nielsen, President and Chief Executive Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this conference call to review our first quarter fiscal 2025 results. Going to slide two. During this call, we will be referring to a slide presentation, which can be found on our website's Investor Center main page. Relevant slides will be identified by number throughout our presentation. Today we have on the call Drew DeFerrari, our Chief Financial Officer, and Ryan Ernest, our General Counsel. Now I will turn over the call to Ryan Ernest. Thank you, Steve. All forward-looking statements made during this conference call are provided pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements include all comments reflecting our expectations, assumptions, or beliefs about future events. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, which may cause actual results to differ materially from current projections, including those risks discussed in the company's filings with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Forward-looking statements are made solely as of the original broadcast date of this conference call, and we assume no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. Steve? Thanks, Ryan. Now moving to slide four and a review of our first quarter results. As we review our results, please note that in our comments today and in the accompanying slides, we reference certain non-GAAP measures. We refer you to slides 14 through 19 for a reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to their corresponding GAAP measures. Now for the quarter. Revenue increased year over year to $1.142 billion, an increase of 9.3%. Organic revenue increased 2.5%. As we deploy gigabit wireline networks, wireless wireline converged networks, and wireless networks, this quarter reflected an increase in demand from two of our top five customers. Gross margin was 19.3% of revenue and increased 95 basis points compared to the first quarter of fiscal 2024. General and administrative expenses were 8.3% of revenue, and all of these factors produced adjusted EBITDA of $130.9 million, or 11.5% of revenue, and earnings per share of $2.12. Liquidity was solid at $573.6 million. Pro forma for our recently closed five-year extension to our senior credit facility, liquidity was $707 million. In May, we completed an acquisition that extends our geographic footprint to Alaska. And finally, during the quarter, we repurchased 210,000 shares of our common stock for $29.8 million. Now going to slide five. Today, major industry participants are constructing or upgrading significant wireline networks across broad sections of the country. These wireline networks are generally designed to provision gigabit network speeds to individual consumers and businesses, either directly or wirelessly using 5G technologies. Industry participants have stated their belief that a single high-capacity fiber network can most cost-effectively deliver services to both consumers and businesses, enabling multiple revenue streams from a single investment. This view is increasing the appetite for fiber deployments, and we believe that the industry's effort to deploy high-capacity fiber networks continues to meaningfully broaden the set of opportunities for our industry. We are encouraged that a number of our customers are pursuing strategic transactions aimed largely in part to increase access to capital and expand fiber deployment programs. Increasing access to high-capacity telecommunications continues to be crucial to society, especially for rural America. 
The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act includes over $40 billion for the construction of rural communications networks in unserved and underserved areas across the country under the B program. This represents an unprecedented level of support and meaningfully increases the rural market that we expect will ultimately be addressed. All states and territories have submitted their initial B proposals. As of early this week, eight states and territories have completed all 10 required steps, while 45 others have completed nine of the 10. Once all 10 steps are completed, a state can request 20% or more of its allocated B funding. To date, approximately $6 billion, or 14% of the program total, has received initial proposal approval. In addition, substantially all states have commenced programs that will provide funding for telecommunications networks even prior to the initiation of funding under the Infrastructure Act. We are providing program management, planning, engineering and design, aerial, underground and wireless construction and fulfillment services for gigabit deployments. These services are being provided across the country in numerous geographic areas to multiple customers. These deployments include networks consisting entirely of wired network elements and converged wireless wireline multi-use networks. Fiber network deployment opportunities are increasing in rural America as new industry participants respond to emerging societal initiatives. We continue to provide integrated planning, engineering and design, procurement and construction and maintenance services to several uh, industry participants. Macroeconomic conditions appear stable. In addition, the market for labor has improved in many regions around the country. Automotive and equipment supply chains are also improving, although the supply of mid-duty chassis is still somewhat constrained. Prices for capital equipment continue to increase, but at a moderating rate. For several customers, we expect the pace of deployments to increase this year including two significant customers whose capital expenditures were more heavily weighted toward the first half of calendar year 2023. Within this context, we remain confident that our scale and financial strength position us well to deliver valuable service to our customers. Moving to slide six. During the quarter, revenue increased 9.3%. Our top five customers combined produced 56.4% of revenue which was essentially flat organically. Demand increased from two of our top five customers. All other customers increased 5.7% organically. AT&T was our largest customer at 18.9% of revenue, or 215.5 million. AT&T grew sequentially for the second consecutive quarter. Lumen was our second largest customer, 13.7% of total revenue, or 156.8 million. Lumen grew organically 15%. This was our ninth consecutive quarter of organic growth with Lumen. Revenue from Comcast was $105 million, or 9.2% of revenue. Comcast was DICOM's third largest customer. Charter was our fourth largest customer at $89.1 million, or 7.8% of revenue. Charter grew 121.8% organically. And finally, Verizon was our fifth largest customer at 78.2 million or 6.8% of revenue. This is the 21st consecutive quarter where all of our other customers in aggregate, excluding the top five customers, have grown organically. Of note, fiber construction revenue from electric utilities was 96 million in the quarter. We have extended our geographic reach and expanded our program management network planning services. In fact, over the last several years, we believe we have meaningfully increased the long-term value of our maintenance and operations business, a trend which we believe will parallel our deployment of gigabit wireline direct and wireless wireline converge networks as those deployments dramatically increase the amount of outside plant network that must be extended and maintained. Now going to slide seven. Backlog at the end of the first quarter was 6.364 billion versus 6.917 billion at the end of the January 2024 quarter, a decrease of 553 million. Of this backlog, approximately 3.863 billion is expected to be completed in the next 12 months. 
Backlog activity during the first quarter reflects solid performance as we book new work and renewed existing work. We continue to anticipate substantial future opportunities across a broad array of our customers. During the quarter, we received from Frontier a construction and maintenance agreement in Illinois, for Comcast a construction agreement in Washington, various rural fiber construction agreements in Washington, Arizona, Tennessee, and Georgia, and various utility line locating agreements in California, Virginia, and Georgia. Headcount was 15,689. Now I will turn the call over to Drew for his financial review and outlook. Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Going to slide eight, contract revenues were $1.142 billion and organic revenue increased 2.5%. Revenue from our recently acquired businesses were $71.2 million in Q1. Adjusted EBITDA was $130.9 million, or 11.5% of contract revenues, compared to $113.5 million, or 10.9% in Q124, an increase of 60 basis points. Gross margin improved 95 basis points to 19.3% of revenue, compared to 18.4% in Q124. G&A expense was 8.3% of revenue, compared to 7.9% in Q124. The increase in G&A reflects higher stock-based and performance-based compensation, as well as an increase in professional fees, including costs related to acquisitions. Net income was $2.12 per share, compared to $1.73 per share in Q1 last year. Results for the quarter include income tax benefits resulting from the vesting and exercise of share-based awards of $5.9 million, or $0.20 per share, compared to $2.7 million, or $0.09 per share in the year-ago quarter. Including these benefits, the change in net income reflects the $17.4 million increase in adjusted EBITDA and higher gains on asset sales, offset by $7.9 million of higher depreciation and amortization, $1.5 million of higher interest expense, and higher stock-based compensation and income tax expense. Going to slide nine, our financial position and balance sheet remain strong. We ended Q1 with $500 million of senior notes, $310.6 $310.6 million of term loan, and $55 million of revolver borrowings outstanding. Cash and equivalents were $26.1 million, and liquidity was $573.6 million. In May, we amended our senior credit facility to expand capacity and extend the maturity to January 2029. Under the new facility, we now have $450 million of term loan outstanding, and an undrawn $650 million revolving credit facility. On a pro forma basis, if the new facility was in place as of April 2024, total liquidity would have increased by approximately $133 million to $707 million, reflecting increased cash on hand and higher revolver availability. Our capital allocation continues to prioritize organic growth followed by M&A and opportunistic share repurchases within the context of our historical range of net leverage. Going to slide 10, cash flows used in operating activities were $37.4 million to support sequential growth in Q1. The combined DSOs of accounts receivable and net contract assets were 110 days, a reduction of 10 days sequentially reflecting normal seasonal impacts and collections from customers during the quarter. Capital expenditures were $29.3 million net of disposal proceeds, and gross CapEx was $42 million. During Q1, we acquired a telecommunications construction contractor based in the Midwest United States for $13 million net of cash acquired. Additionally, during Q2, we have acquired another telecommunications construction contractor for $20.8 million net of cash acquired that expands our geographic footprint to Alaska. During Q1, we repurchased 210,000 shares of our common stock for $29.8 million. Going to slide 11, 
As we look ahead to the second quarter ending July 27, 2024, we expect organic contract revenues to grow by high single digits as a percentage of contract revenues compared to Q224. In addition to the organic revenue growth, we expect approximately 70 million of acquired revenues. We also expect non-GAAP adjusted EBITDA percentage of contract revenues to increase 25 to 75 basis points as compared to Q2 of last year, 6 million of amortization expense, 14.9 million of net interest expense, a 26.5% effective income tax rate, and 29.4 million diluted shares. Now I will turn the call back to Steve. Thanks, Drew. Moving to slide 12. This quarter, we experienced solid activity and capitalized on our significant strengths. First and foremost, we maintain significant customer presence throughout our markets. We are encouraged by the breadth in our business. Our extensive market presence has allowed us to be at the forefront of evolving industry opportunities. Telephone companies are deploying fiber of the home to enable gigabit high-speed connections. Rural electric utilities are doing the same. Dramatically increased speeds for consumers are being provisioned and consumer data usage is growing, particularly upstream. Wireless construction activity in support of newly available spectrum bands continues this year. Federal and state support for rural deployments of communications networks is dramatically increasing in scale and duration. Cable operators are increasing fiber deployments in rural America. Capacity expansion projects are underway. Customers are consolidating supply chains, creating opportunities for market share growth, and increasing the long-term value of our maintenance and operations business. We are pleased that many of our customers are committed to multi-year capital spending initiatives as our nation and industry experience stable economic conditions. We are confident in our strategies, the prospects for our company, the capabilities of our dedicated employees, and the experience of our management team. Now, operator, we will open the call for questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1 in your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question will come from Alex Regal from B. Riley Securities. Your line is open. Good morning, Stephen. Drew, very nice quarter. A couple quick questions here. Um, lots of development talk about AI and data center demand on the electric grid, but how, can you talk about how this mega trend has or may impact your telecom business? And how would you frame AI relative to other communication infrastructure mega trends over the past, you know, few decades? I think, Alex, the, the way I would start is is there's a direct opportunity that as they create more data center capacity, and, and I'm not an expert in this, but but we do monitor the trends, um, sufficient grid power is hard to find. And so we, we are seeing more data centers located in parts of the country that historically have not had the backbone fiber access. Um, that, that the more traditional geographies for data centers. So certainly, certainly there's an opportunity there. I, I think more broadly into the second half of your question, if, if we think about uh, any application that, that learns from and requires ever increasing amounts of data, you've got to collect it and then you've got to uh, process it and then you've got to send it somewhere to be used. And so anything that, that increases demands um, on the network has historically been good for our business. A little early to tell, um, uh, you know, what the magnitude of that may be, uh, but certainly something to, to pay attention to. And then second question, your adjusted EBITDA margin showed some nice improvement, and, and your guidance continues to reflect expansion. Can you remind us where your long-term target is and then talk about some of the things you are doing that is a tailwind to this margin improvement? Yeah, Alex, as we've said before, we, we have seen in periods of time where we have had broad geographic and, and customer diversification um, that we get good operating leverage. And so as we as we have better, um, as we have 
better distribution across customers and geographies, we think that's an opportunity. I mean, we continue to roll out a number of technologies to simplify the field administration of the business to focus on increase, increase productivity. And as I always say, uh, we, had, we had good performance this quarter, uh, but half the business was, was less than the average, and so we could always have things to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question will come from Adam Tallheimer from Thompson Davis. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Nice quarter. Hey, um, Steve, in the prepared remarks, you referenced cable capacity expansion projects. Can you unpack that for us a little bit, and um, could that impact your largest cable customer? Look, I think more broadly that that was talking about the, the, the cable industry focusing on moving to DOCSIS 4.0, uh, either through a mid-split or a high-split uh, approach, as well as through full duplex. And I think as that technology becomes more settled and, and becomes more available throughout this year, there will certainly be opportunities uh, there for growth. Uh, the cable industry uh, broadly is also uh, building out uh, uh, edging out of their existing footprint, and that's also certainly a, a good opportunity for us uh, to grow also. All right, and then um, on the share repurchase activity, uh, $59 million over the past two quarters, how, how would you characterize that? Is this just in line with your normal capital allocation, or do you see the shares as undervalued? I think we can first say that, the, that we're in the money, um, but beyond that, I think we've always focused on um, a, a balanced approach that says, first and foremost, we're going to uh, make sure that we have sufficient capacity to support the growth of our customers uh, and of the industry. I mean, we're a substantial portion or a good, a good portion of the, of the industry, and we want to make sure we can always support uh, industry and customer growth. Uh, and then we're going to look at, at acquisitions versus uh, share repurchase. I think we've been encouraged on the acquisition side. We've always had an opportunistic approach um, to acquisitions, um, and we're seeing more opportunities. I think uh, a little bit counterintuitively with the normalizing of interest rates, we see value that we didn't see a couple of years ago. Um, and, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to take advantage of those opportunities uh, when we can. And of course, the last thing which supports all of it is if you look at our EBITDA, um, over the last couple of years, it's doubled. Uh, leverage has come in and so we have more financial capacity to explore, uh, to explore all the options across organic growth, M&A, and share repurchase. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Our next question will come from Sangeeta Jane from KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, Steve. Good morning. Um, I had a couple questions. One on the backlog. Um, I understand it's a seasonally slow quarter, but just trying to get a sense of um, the backlog versus the dynamics of the strong revenue growth forecast that you gave us, if you could help us there. Sure. So it, it was a quiet quarter with customers. That's not unusual for that part of the year. I think the other thing to keep in mind, Sangeet, is if you look at the next 12 months, uh, basically in line with the January quarter, even though we do have some contracts that are annual and renewed, you know, at, at the end of each calendar year. And so I, I guess what I would say is right now we're focused on the next 12 months and the organic revenue guide. Um, and, and duration and total backlog is always important, but in this current environment, um, something we pay attention to, but we're much more focused on next 12 months. Got it. That's helpful. And also on the Alaska acquisition that you announced, is that um, – is that in any way you looking out at the bead opportunity because it looks like Alaska got a decent amount of funding on bead, or are there any other drivers for that acquisition? Well, first and foremost, Sangeeta, we like the folks that we bought the business from. One of the there are two partners. One of the partners actually worked for us a little less than 20 years ago. 
the other partner was a customer a little less than 20 years ago. So we're, we're pleased with the opportunity to get together with folks that we've known for a long time and have great established reputations and track records. Uh, and, and then, as you point out, uh, Alaska received a little over a billion dollars of bead money. They've also received um, some USDA money. Uh, and, and it's just a we, – we think it's an opportunity – um, to, to grow where that funding is going to become available with people that we know uh, and respect. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Our next question will come from Alex Waters from B of A. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, maybe first, Steve, can you maybe talk about any impact you see from the Unity and Windstream merger? I know Windstream is a top 10 customer for you guys. And then secondly, pretty strong um, performance from the electric utilities this quarter. Uh, could you just maybe give a little bit more color on that and what the runway associated is? Thanks. Thanks. Good morning, Alex. So, so yes, we have worked for Windstream for decades. Um, and so we are certainly encouraged that when they, when uh, Unity announced the, the merger, um, that, that it, that they identified that in part the merger is motivated by the desire to do more fiber to the home, up to a million additional passings. And so yes, we, we think that Unity Windstream as well as EQT, T-Mobile, Lumos and other, uh, strategic, uh, activity in the industry is all around how do they raise more capital? How do they become more uh, financially flexible so that people can deploy more CapEx on the things that we do, build fiber to the home? So, yeah, we are encouraged by Windstream and, and Unity. And I think with, with respect to the electric utilities, it's a nice sec segment. It's grown substantially for us over the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, and it, it just shows – how strong the trend is in rural America and how many participants see value in deploying fiber, uh, and we think that's going to continue. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from Stephen Fisher from UBS. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Um, just wanted to ask you about growth and availability of resources, obviously strong quarter. I'm curious how you're thinking about the stars are, are lining up on timing of a lot of these funding programs uh, and customer demand. I'm wondering if, if you think your fiscal 26 is going to require a, a much broader level of, of contractor resources, and are the resources uh, available to, to handle strong double-digit growth if, if that's how it lines up? And should we think about uh, that we'll start to see it more in your hiring ahead of that, or will you turn to more uh, subcontracting and just essentially, I guess, are, are we on the edge of much faster growth here, and, and uh, is the industry ready to, to handle it? Yeah, Steve, I, I guess what I would say is that, that labor supply has been improving. We've identified that, I think, for the last two or three quarters. Um, so uh, as, the, as we get bigger and as the industry gets bigger, its ability to add resources on the margin increases. And so I think that that's encouraging. Um, as, as we've talked about before, over the last three years, we've added, you know, in excess of a billion dollars of organic growth. And, and as you get bigger, your ability to do that get, gets better. Um, so it won't be easy, never is, but we feel confident that with the right customers applying ourselves to the right opportunities where we can be most helpful, um, that we can uh, continue to grow. Uh, there will always be a mixture of, of in-house uh, hires, depending on the line of business and geography uh, and, and what's available uh, through subcontractors. Uh, but I think we're also perceived as to be a good partner to our subcontractors, and I think as opportunities develop, we'll uh, we'll be able to get our fair share. Okay, and then it looks like you're starting to add some consistency in this 25 to 75 basis points of, of year-over-year margin improvement. 
how should we think about you know, what's really driving that? Is that really just general operating leverage as your revenues grow, you get just a little bit more absorption? Or is there better pricing going into backlog relative to what you're reporting on a trailing basis versus some of the initiatives you talk about, productivity things and uh, some of the sort of the back office? So how do we think about what's what's really within that 25 to 75 basis points of margin improvement, and, you know, is there anything that would take it up or down from here in sort of the next handful of quarters? Yeah, and Steve, I think you touched on, on the way we, we think about the business. I mean, clearly when you get good organic growth and you get broadly distributed growth across customers and geographies, that's your best recipe for operating leverage. And so clearly, uh, that, that's probably first and foremost. Second, I think given the scale of the enterprise now and it's our, our geographic coverage, we work hard to make sure that we're committing resources to customers in areas where we can perform for them uh, and for ourselves. So we want to make sure that where we commit that we'll do a really great job for the customer and usually when we do a really great job for the customer, we're able to perform better for ourselves. And then I, I, I think um, we're always going to, to continue to work hard on taking cost out of the business. Uh, we're, we're using lots of tools that we connect with crews now wirelessly. We try to move data uh, electronically rather than uh, and then the old way. And, again, based on our scale, we're making investments there that, frankly, I don't see other people making uh, at the same level. So I think a, a combination of good operating leverage, uh, the ability to make sure we only commit in places where we can do a good job for the customer, uh, and then investing at scale in things that, uh, that, that you have to have our scale to be good at. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Frank Lauthan from Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good morning. This is Rob Warren for Frank. Uh, congratulations on the quarter. So uh, from our recent contact with the states, um, it doesn't appear there will be any bead-related construction being done this year. Um, is that your expectation as well? And then as a follow-up, uh, based on what you're seeing in the locate business, What's your outlook on how the U.S. economy is faring so far this year relative to how it looked coming into January? You see more activity, less overall. Any color you can provide us with would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, on on deed, Rob, I think what I would tell you is that there has has been a pickup in the number of states that have gotten uh, first step approval or actually second-step approval, so there are actually eight states that are ready to, to start the subgrantee process, including four that have over a billion dollars. So I think incrementally we feel more positive than we did three months ago. Obviously, lots to do. It, it, it's interesting, Rob. Those eight states have about $6 billion of funding. Of course, there's a required 25% match, so call it 7 or $8 billion. That's bigger than the 2009 stimulus. <laughs> that kept us quite busy for a couple, three years. Um, so so it's amazing, you know, just the scale of it. I, I think next year, I think you're right. I think it's the first half of next year, first quarter. Uh, but there are some states here that are moving rapidly and we're having some conversations with. So hopefully it'll be a little bit sooner. But I think it will be uh, worth the wait based on everything that we know today. And then I, I would tell you that just kind of our own internal indicators – um, turned positive um, in that business uh, fall of last year, and they've continued to improve, and uh, we'll hope that continues. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Brent Thielman from DA Davidson. Your line is open. Uh, great, thanks. Um, a couple just on the quarter. The other income item below the operating line seemed to be a larger than usual benefit, and then similarly a much lower tax rate this quarter. Can you just clarify what those items are related to? Yeah, Brent, uh, this is Drew. So in the other income, you'll see the gain on sale. 
uh, was a little bit higher uh, this quarter. So from, that's from disposal proceeds um, on assets as we're buying new and, and selling existing. And then on the tax rate, um, we did call out in the comments, and you'll see it in the slides as well, uh, we did have a benefit of about $0.20 cents per share, uh, which was related to the vesting and exercise of, of uh, share-based awards. And so that comes through as a benefit on the tax line. So I think if you strip that out, um, the the rate, the effective tax rate for the quarter was a little over 26.5%, and that's uh, where I've got it in the outlook as well. Okay, appreciate that, Drew. Um, and then, Steve, I guess just to follow up on the overall data center opportunity for, for DICOM, I mean, a lot of this, these projects seem to be well underway, obviously more potentially to come in terms of planning. Could you just help us understand what, what's been the benefit to the business directly or indirectly to date? Um, understand that, you know, you'll need more backhaul in the future, but presumably – You'll need that sooner than later. So I just wanted to get my head wrapped around how you're you're looking at this and what's actually been the impact to your business so far. Yeah, Brent, I I know it's the topic of the day on the street, but I would say the impact's been modest uh, on the business. So it's all upside depending on on how it develops. Uh, But it it is not an area where we've seen a material uh, impact on the business as of yet. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question will come from Eric Lubko from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, so, Steve, you, you talked about two of your top customers starting to increase the pace of deployments versus uh, a bit more of a pull forward into the first quarter last year. So, is, is your expectation with those two customers they'll kind of grow sequentially from here, we'll we'll see the growth path be a little bit steadier versus uh, what was a little bit more of a a volatile, um, you know, quarterly pace last year. Yeah, I I think we're pleased with how both of those customers developed uh, from the January quarter into the April quarter, and we feel good about the year, and we think they're they're growing as we lap um, the easier comps in the back half of last year. Uh, And I think they both have large programs, and uh, and we're pleased that we're able to participate. And uh, you had a comment in your uh, in your uh, prepared remarks about wireless CapEx to support new spectrum deployments. Um, just curious if you're seeing any green shoots or inflection points. I know wireless spending broadly has been has slowed quite a bit uh, the last couple of years. Um, I don't know if you're seeing any opportunities to deploy new spectrum or densify existing sites that could uh, – you know, improve the trajectory of, of that business for you? Yeah, I guess what I would say, Eric, is it's less than 4% of revenue now, and, and right now we don't anticipate any return to growth anytime soon. Um, the, the carriers continue to do a great job of deploying Spectrum pretty efficiently, uh, and so we, we have not seen any significant change uh, since last quarter. Great. Now I'll sneak one more in, Steve. Um, just as you look at some of these, the bead and the rural fiber programs that uh, are coming up, you know, do you think there'll be any real kind of margin differential in building fiber in those more rural areas versus more or urban? And does it depend on whether the incumbents are, you know, planning to build within or adjacent to their islet footprints versus out of footprint, which I know can be a lot more challenging for them? Eric, there's there's nothing inherent in any build, whether it's rural, urban, or suburban, as to what the margins are. It's always a function of the the capital that's required uh, on the program and the complexity of managing it with the customer. Um, we do lots of rural work today, and we're pleased with the results. Uh, and so we're not, you know, we're not thinking that the shift will have a material impact one way or another on our overall sense of the margin directory of the of the company. Uh, clearly, as you identified, to the extent that incumbents are able to utilize their existing pole attachment agreements, central offices or head ends or, you know, other facilities that they already have cited there, uh, that, that will be helpful. And then I, I would say, and we've talked about this before, we serve on a, on a for 
maintenance master service agreements, we serve broad sections of rural America right now, and it'll be great to have more to do um, through those footprints. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Our next question comes from Christian Schwab from Craig Hallam Capital Group. Your line is now open. Hey, hey Steve, uh, just to follow up on BEAD, uh, I know that the Commerce Secretary has been telling Congress that they want all the states to be approved and the money to start being dispersed as soon as this fall. Um, so I want to go back to your feeling better about that market than, say, you did 90 days ago. Um, do you think we'll be in a, a really strong, broader position? I know you talked about, you know, $9 billion of just a handful of states, plus or minus. But um, do you think as we go into 25, you know, uh, I'm just wondering if you just add a little bit more color on your enthusiasm for worth the wait? Yeah, Christian, I think we've always taken an appropriately uh, conservative view as to how quickly uh, any government program will start up. But I think this is a classic example, Christian, of sometimes we over-anticipate but then really underappreciate. I mean, this is a big program. If it starts in the fourth quarter of 24, the first quarter of 25, in 2026, I don't think anybody's going to remember because of the magnitude of the program. Uh, as I said earlier, if you think about this relative to the, the most comparable program 15 years ago, uh, the money that's awarded now for eight states is larger than the amount of money that was dedicated to the entire country. And, and just to remind everybody on that earlier program that was about six and a half billion, um, when it was all said and done, through our own efforts and then with the companies that we had acquired in 2012 on a pro forma basis, we did about eight or nine percent of that entire program. So this is a big opportunity. And that is a great segue to my next question, Steve, is, you know, given the tremendous amount of infrastructure dollars, um, you know, not only in fiber, but, but elsewhere, um, do you feel like there's uh, less competition um, or the potential for less new entrants to come into the marketplace to uh, chase after those dollars that um, are kind of used to getting dirty and dealing with heavy equipment that, that you might have expected, you know, previously? I think, Chris, in my view on competition is we're in a highly competitive industry. As we do well, we're going to attract competition. That's as true today as it was 20, 25 years ago, so just something that we're going to deal with. I, what I do, what I think we can say is as the programs become larger and more complex, we think there's a real return to the singular focus on this industry that we have, and that helps us to perform better and win our fair share um, against those who might be more diversified. Great. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alan Matrani from Sylvan Lake Asset Management. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions, if I can. You said uh, on CapEx, can you give us an, maybe I missed it, can you give us an upda updated guide for the year? And also, uh, why is it that your CapEx missed what you thought it would be this quarter? Go ahead, Drew. Yeah, Alan, um, we haven't updated the CapEx from where we were. We still anticipate the 220 to 230. Um, you know, if you look at the net number for the quarter, and to uh, add on to Brent's earlier question, we did have higher uh, disposals in the quarter that's net into that number. Um, yeah, on a gross basis, Alan, it was in line yeah. with our expectations. And uh, okay. as quick as we get it, we're putting it to work. No problem. Maybe just miss my expectations for the quarter. That's fine. Um, question for you. The, uh, the two acquisitions, uh, acquisitions, can you give us the, uh, the revenue run rate? Uh, for each of those acquisitions, either trailing 12 or past calendar year? I mean, Alan, we, we, we provided in Drew's comments the purchase price. We're, we're not going to drill down into the, into the revenue on something that's a bolt-on, other than to say that we're pleased uh, with, with, uh, with both those acquisitions as well as the one that we did last year. And uh, to the extent that they're more available, we'll continue to look at them. Okay. Um, 
And then on SG&A, the numbers seem, the absolute dollar numbers seem pretty high relative to the increase in revenues year over year, 10 million increase. I realized a little bit, a million and change of it was, uh, was let's say, non-stock comp. But is there something else, the percentage of revenue is fairly high versus the past? Is there something else, yeah, like a meaning, like some non-recurring besides some of the professional fees that were in there that made that so much higher? Um, so, Alan, you know, obviously we had better than expected organic revenue growth this quarter, and then we expect that, um, as if you look at the outlook, to increase into next quarter as well. And then when our results increase, um, both the performance-based stock comp as well as regular performance compensation increases, and that impacts G&A. Um, as you highlighted, there was some, you know, M&A type costs that hit the number um, as well. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing I w- would add, Alan, is is we we'll, we look at our growth outlook. We're we're going to make sure that we invest uh, in in the right program controls and the right G and A processes to make sure that when we get them, that we achieve the 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 uh, margins that we anticipate. Okay, thank you. And then one final question, relative to the stock uh, to the repurchase of shares, I saw in your annual letter. You highlighted over the last, uh, since you've been CEO, and way back how you guys have bought stock back at pretty good prices, clearly, and it's been a good investment. But I still look at your stock, even though it's hitting all-time highs here and doubled since October. You still trade, whether everybody's overvalued or not, you still trade at a, anywhere from a 30 to 100% discount to most of uh, most other comps that, that I would look at, either specialty contractors or other contractors, and yet your margins are higher than most of them and your leverage is lower. Do you have a thought process on that relative to what you're seeing in the market or what valuations are? Alan, it's like that old statement, right? In, in the short term, the market is a uh, is it a weighing machine. I forget what the saying is. But, look, we're going to run the business fundamentally uh, in the way that has been successful over a long period of time. To the extent that the market gives us opportunities to allocate capital to reduce ownership claims on the future, and we think the future is bright, then we're going to do that. And uh, I've been doing it a long time. You know, everything rotates around, but at the end of the day, uh, you run the business as best you can, and the market will take care of itself. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from Stephen Fisher from UBS. Your line is open. Well, thanks. Just a couple of quick follow-ups. Um, not sure if I missed it, but the $55 million of revolving facility that you added in the quarter, uh, what what was that for? Was that related to the buybacks and acquisitions you already did, or was that something more, uh, for more of what's to come? No, I, I think, Steve, and this is true. So, um Seasonally, we use, we consume some working capital. So if you, if you look, um, we did use some uh, operating cash flows in the quarter, and that just funded the business. Funded the business. We also did close the acquisition uh, that we or one of the acquisitions in the quarter as well, um, which was the one with the thirteen million dollar purchase price. Yeah, and and Steve, I, I guess what I would add is that we we have had a long practice here to renew credit facilities a couple of years before the maturity dates. And so we had a maturity date in April of 26. And so we've now extended that out to uh, April of 29. January 29. Jan- January. 2029. Uh, Drew corrects me, January of 2029. And and that just, you know, just ordinary course. And uh, and so that's uh, that's why we did what we did on the credit facility. Okay. Yeah, I thought it might be working capital, but last year's Q1, you did not have a draw on it. So, but anyway, um, and just to follow up on Alan's question on the, uh, the acquired revenues, to, is there any puts and takes to the expectation for Q2? Because it seems roughly steady at about $70 million with Q1, but, uh, presumably you'll have uh, you know, more acquisitions in this quarter than you had uh, last quarter. So just curious if there's some puts and takes that, that are keeping that from, from being higher. Steve, I think all of the businesses are performing well. When they're smaller businesses, they tend to have a little more volatility quarter to quarter. 
and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves uh, in giving you that kind of non-organic expectation. Um, the, the Alaska acquisition, believe it or not, hasn't really gone to work yet. That's kind of a June thing. And so, uh, so they're not going to be a significant con contributor this quarter until we get deeper into June and July. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And I am showing no further questions from our phone lines. And I'd like to turn the conference back over to Stephen Nielsen for any closing remarks. Well, we thank everybody for your time and attendance and, uh, and, and interest, and we look forward to speaking to you again on our next quarter, which will be the third week of August. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Everyone, have a wonderful day.